Have you ever lost something that you just had to find and you, and, and you did whatever it took to find it? You were seeking like you couldn't believe that you had actually lost it and you were gonna, your life was going to end if you didn't find it. You ever had something like that? Some of you might say like your spouse, right, or uh, an elusive victory or a diploma. But I remember uh, years ago, it was a couple years ago, that uh, my wife, uh, she was driving to church and she was stopped at the intersection down the way, and, and she was putting lotion on her hands. And apparently when you put lotion on your hands, you're supposed to take your rings off. I didn't know that. I, I've never done that. But she took her, her wedding ring off that I got her back in, let's see, it would have been November of 94. And I got her that wedding ring. She took it off, and she put it in her lap, and she continued on to church. And then um, my wife, she, she normally... Um, doesn't get here early. Let's just say it that way, right? And so uh, she, she comes into church, and later on that day, she realizes that she's lost her wedding ring, and, and she goes back through the day. She goes, I, I know, I took it off, and I, was, I, I ran into church, and she was out in this parking lot over here, and and so we came up here, we looked all over, couldn't find it, tore the, tore the vehicle apart trying to find it in there. I, I borrowed a metal detector from a friend, uh, I mean, because, you know, that, that's going to be a costly replacement item, right? Um, but more important than that was the sentimental value, just so you guys all know that. But, I mean, we looked all over the place for this ring, and we, we never found it. And you say, well, that's kind of a, a sad story to start off. Yeah, it is. I had to pay for another one. But uh, um, <laughs> seeking things that are lost and finding things that are of value. Today, we're going to be looking in the narrative on, on seeking and finding the most important thing in life, and that is a relationship with God. If you have your Bibles, if you want to turn to 2 Chronicles 15, we're going to read the whole chapter today and, and walk through some lessons that we can learn from King Asa. Now, now, in Second Chronicles 15, Asa is king of Judah. John just talked about a king, and, and one of the things that, that we have to understand, Asa is king of Judah. Now, that's going to uh, be a little confusing because we're like, well, isn't this about Israel? But let me take you down a little historical path real quick so you understand what's going on in Israel at this time. Last week, we were talking about Solomon and Ecclesiastes. And Solomon, he was, he was the king over the entire Israel nation, as was David and Saul before him. But here we come to a, a problem with Solomon's son, Rehoboam. He's the fourth king of the whole nation of Israel, the 12 tribes. But he decides to kind of be a jerk, and a lot of the, the nations, a lot of the, I'm sorry, the tribes rebel against him, and, and they go and start their own, the northern kingdom. It's a civil war type thing going on. So you have the northern kingdom that really has 11 of the tribes, and then the southern kingdom, which is Judah. So you have Judah, which is where Jesus comes from, David's from, and then you have the rest. So you have the north and you have the south. And uh, so we come into this time of Asa, and throughout the course of the divided kingdom, there were 19 kings in Israel, the northern kingdom, and there were 20 kings in the southern kingdom, in Judah. Out of the 19 in Israel, there were zero that were good. There was one that was, uh, he was kind of iffy. He was okay at some points, uh, but there were 18 bad ones. Now, of the 20 kings in Judah, there were four that were good. Only four out of 20, and, and there were four that were so-so, uh, and then there were 12 that were bad. But Asa is one of those ones we look at, and we say, this is a good king. Uh, he's trying to do what's right, and part of that comes uh, from him seeking after God and, and realizing that God needs to be in charge of the country that he's over, which at this point is Judah. So that's kind of the setup for it. Asa and, and, the, and Judah, they're coming off a of victory in battle, and they're in high spirits, and they're, they're coming back, and they have all this plunder, and God brings a message to him from the prophet Azariah. So we'll read the first six verses here uh, to start us off. The Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time Israel was out without the true God, without a priest to teach and without the law. But in their distress they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him, and he was found by them. In those days it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another and one city by another because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. 
So the prophet Azariah, he's coming, he's saying, here's, here's the scenario, here's uh, what's going on. Uh, if you really want to know God, you want to be with God, uh, you need to seek him. Uh, you need to make sure that uh, you, you find him. And he's not hard to find, by the way. Uh, God desires to be found. Uh, he says, you will find him when you seek him with all your heart. That's a reference back to Jeremiah 29, 13, which we'll look at here in a minute. Uh, but he's saying God can be found, and, and he is with you when you are with him. It's a very important message that Azariah is bringing to King Asa. It's important for us to see it. And, and then he goes in for the next few verses. He says, there was a time where there was no true God in Israel. And this is referencing the judges, the time of the judges where, where they would rebel against God, they would be oppressed, and then ultimately they would repent and turn back. It says when they came back to God, he would take care of them, and then they left him again. So he's saying we don't want to repeat that process. Just look at the northern kingdom. They're doing that. Uh, but ultimately, Azariah says, to find the Lord, here's what you need, Asa, and this is what Asa does. He says you need to seek the Lord. To find him, you need to seek it, it, you know, in hide and seek, when people are, are, are hiding, uh, you, you seek them to find them to win the game. Well, well, God is not hiding. We don't play hide and seek with God. We just play seek it, it, because he wants to be found. God is not some elusive medallion at the Wichita River Fest that you've got to find all the clues and know what, what's going on, know the history of Wichita, know everything in order to get this little medal and get a few hundred bucks. That's not God. He's, he, he's not as elusive as, as the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. God is not uh, some, some mystical thing that we're like, oh, I hope I can find God. God reveals himself to us in so many ways. Through his word, through his spirit, through his creation. Romans 1.20 says uh, that, that God reveals himself through creation. People should know if they just look at the skies and they declare his glory and they look at creation, the order of things. God wants to be found. And God wants us to seek him. Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. It's not like when you're, you're, you're out going about your day and you kind of look over and you see something nice. You're like, oh, that's cool. Or, or I hope that I see a, a certain kind of bird. Or I hope that I see this and you see it and you're like, oh, that's cool. This is, you'll, you'll seek me with all your heart. As much as we wanted to find that wedding ring. You know, it's seeking God more than that. God is not a possession. God is not a, a thing. He's a person who desires a relationship with his creation. And he's made that available to us through Jesus. When we don't seek the Lord, it says we're not with him. It's frustrating so many times. And I don't know if you guys get frustrated by this. And maybe it's just me, so let me rant because my mic's on, but uh, I get frustrated so many times when people are living so opposed to God. They're living in a way that, that doesn't even honor God one iota, and, and then they, they go through something, they, they go through trouble, or, or, or then they want to say, well, uh, God gave me this, God blessed me. This. I'm like, no, you don't understand. God, God is not with you when you are not with him. You, you can't say it. A lot of people think because they, they live in a Christian nation and, and uh, in God we trust is our national motto. It's on our, our dollar bills that, that, that they're okay with God. No, it's a personal relationship. For Asa, he had to seek after God. For you and I, we have to seek after God. Uh, we need to seek and, be, and, and find him. When, when we are with him, he is with us. The scripture tells us that. And God desires to be with all of us. It's not like he doesn't want to be with us. He wants to be with us. And he's given us a way to be with him. And that is by us following Jesus. If you seek him, he'll be found. If you forsake him, he will forsake you. He says, seek me with all your heart. You say, well, but we don't have Azariah walking up to us and saying, hey, Jeff, really, you know, in order to know what God says, here's what. No, God, has, we, we have something better than Azariah. We have the word of God. We have his Holy Spirit that reveals uh, what he desires in our life. We have godly people that can surround us with wisdom. We need to follow Jesus. Uh, he's available, but we're lost without him. You can't be in relationship with God without Jesus. And you say, well, well, that doesn't seem right. If God loves me, if God can be found by me, why can't I be in a relationship with him? Because you're dirty. <laughs> How's that? Wow, you're very judgmental today, Jeff. Well, welcome to Sunday. 
Now, uh, it's because we have sin upon us, and, and sin separates us from God. Sin makes us unrighteous, and God is righteous, and he cannot be in unrighteous relationship. And, and so God said, Jeff, you can't, you can't pay enough for your dirty unrighteousness, your sins. You can't pay for that in order to get back to me. But in order to be with them, we have to become righteous. And if I can't pay for it, and the Bible says that I deserve to go to a real place called hell for those sins that I've committed against God and others, that's what I deserve. But God says, I love you so much, Jeff, and fill in your name that I made a way for your sins to be paid for and for you to become righteous. And that is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's through his blood that was shed so that our sins could be forgiven, so that what I've done, my dirty, unrighteous sins are washed clean through the blood of Jesus. It's a beautiful, beautiful transaction. It doesn't even make sense. But God loves us enough that he wants us to be in relationship with him, so he makes that happen. We need to follow Jesus, surrender our lives to Jesus. If you've never done that, uh, we would encourage you to do that and text the word follow to the number on the screen. Uh, we, We would love for you to know what it means to follow after Jesus. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 7, and a lot of people read this the wrong way, and so hopefully this makes sense when I tell you this. But in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. I mean, you read that and at first glance, you're like, woohoo! This is my Christmas list with Jesus. This is what do I want for my birthday with Jesus. This is, I'm going to put down everything. I mean, I want that extra long cab, extra long bed. I want that, I want to make sure that it shines, it sparkles. I need some extra bathrooms, some extra bedrooms. I need a couple extra zeros in my bank accounts. I need that special someone. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's not saying Ask for the, uh, the spouse of your dreams, and it will be given to you. I mean, you guys could be as lucky as me and get that, but that's not what he's saying here, right? I just had to make up for the comment earlier. <laughs> what he's saying is ask according to the will of God. Line yourself up with what God desires, and it will be given to you. You want your sins forgiven? Ask, and it will be given. Seek him and you will find him. Knock the door and eternity will be opened up to you through Jesus. It's important for us to understand context of what Jesus is saying here. So many people think it's, ooh, I get all this stuff. And and it's not that. Jesus can be found by anybody who seeks him. There's a book that I read a couple years ago. Uh, This guy has has passed away, unfortunately, with with cancer. Uh, Nabil Qureshi. Uh, he was a, a faithful, devout Muslim, and he encountered Christ. And, uh, and this book just shows how uh, all of his education in Islam uh, came crashing down as he found out the truth of Scripture and found out the truth of Jesus. I'm going to just read the first couple pages here to you. He goes back to uh, his wrestling with uh, Islam and Christianity. I lay prostrate in a large Muslim prayer hall, broken before God. The edifice of my worldview, all I had ever known, had slowly been dismantled over the past few years. On this day, my world came crashing down. I lay in ruins, seeking Allah. Fading footsteps echoed through the halls of the mosque as the humid summer evening drew to a close. The other worshipers were heading back to their homes and families for the night, but my thoughts were still racing. Every fiber of my being wrestled with itself, with my forehead pressed into the ground and heart pounding in my chest. My mind scrutinized each word my lips whispered into the musty carpet. These were not new words. I had been taught to recite this Arabic phrase 132 times every single day from a time before I even knew my name. It was the Sajjah, the portion of the ritual prayers in which Muslims lower themselves before Allah, glorifying his loftiness. The words had always flowed with ease, but this day was different. As my lips exercised their rote rituals, my mind questioned everything I thought I knew about God. Subhana Rabbi Allah, glorified is my Lord, the highest. Glorified is my Lord. Who is my Lord? Who are you, Lord? Are you Allah, the God of my father and forefathers? Are you the God I've always worshipped, the God my family has always worshipped? Surely you are the one who sent Muhammad as the final messenger for mankind, and the Quran is our guide. You are Allah, the God of Islam. Aren't you, or are you? I hesitated, fighting the blasphemy I was about to propose. But what if the blasphemy was the truth? Or are you Jesus? My heart froze, as if indignant at my mind for risking hell. Allah, I would never say that a man became equal to you. Please forgive me and have mercy on me if that's what I said, because that's not what I mean. No man is equal to you. You are infinitely greater than all creation. Everything bows down before you, Allah. 
No, what I meant to say is that you, O oh Allah, are all powerful. Surely you can enter into creation if you choose. Did you enter into this world? Did you become a man? And was that man Jesus? Oh, Allah, the Bible couldn't be right, could it? As if on parallel timelines, my lips continue to pray in Saja while my mind relentlessly fought with itself. The Arabic phrase was to be recited twice more before the Saja would be complete. Glorified is my Lord, the highest. But how is it conceivable that Allah, the highest being of all, would enter into this world? This world is filthy and sinful, no place for the one who deserves all glory and all praise. And how could I even begin to suggest that God, the magnificent and splendid creator, would enter into this world through the birth canal of a girl? That's disgusting. To have to eat, to grow fatigued, and to sweat and spill blood, and to be finally nailed to a cross? I cannot believe this. God deserves infinitely more. His majesty is far greater than this. But what if his majesty is not as important to him as his children are? A devout Muslim who realizes the truth of Jesus, surrenders his life to Jesus, then spends his life defending Christ to those that think he's a traitor and an infidel. The voice of God is not elusive. That's why you, you hear of so many dreams and visions in the Muslim world and around the world as, as people are seeking out the truth. God will be found by those who are seeking the truth. His word says this. He's a man of his word. I love what we read in Acts chapter 17 as, as, as Paul's talking uh, to those and telling them about Christ. He, he says this in verse 24 to 28. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by, by human hands. And if he needed anything, rather, let he himself gives everything life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Paul's saying, hey, when you're seeking the truth, when you're seeking out God, you will find him. He makes himself available to those who seek him. He is, he is who we live for and as, <laughs> we are his offspring. He desires to be found by us. So we need to seek the Lord. We need to follow Jesus. Let's go to the next verse and a half here. We'll read through the middle of verse 8. Azariah continues, and he says to Asa, But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. When Asa heard these words in the prophecy of Azariah, son of Oded, the prophet, he took courage. We're going to stop there. We'll come back and finish it in a minute. Hey, be strong. Continue on. And Asa took courage. Another thing that, that is said here is that you're to stay faithful to the Lord, even when it's hard, even when you need more courage. Uh, you, you are to stay faithful. Stay faithful to the Lord. It's worth it. Not follow up. He goes, stay the course, and you will be rewarded. It's, it might not be easy, but you're going to be rewarded for being faithful to God. The same thing goes for us today. That there is a response that Asa has to have now. He, he hears the message, and then it comes to uh, it, it's, it's do or die time, right? It's go to the restroom or get off the pot type time. I mean, that's what it is. And Asa decides he's going to be faithful to the Lord. He's going to commit to that. It takes strength to be on God's side. Uh, do you know courage is a byproduct? When we trust God with our lives, courage is a byproduct that we get. We're able to have courage to do things like go up against a nine-foot giant, uh, to, to go up against authority that is against God. To stand up for truth in the midst of a world that doesn't. We get that courage from God. The Bible tells us we have a spirit of power, of love and self-discipline, not timidity. We're to stay faithful and to have courage. For us, we say, commit to the mission of Jesus. Right? Part of our, 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 our statement we say all the time around here, follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, commit to the mission of Jesus. We're called to a journey. And that journey is not always easy. Being a Christ follower is not always easy. I mean, it's not one of those things that it just comes naturally. Matter of fact, it's, it, it's against our nature. Our, our nature wants to do all the bad stuff. Our nature wants to say all the bad stuff. Our nature wants it to be all about us. 
And following Jesus is different. Being committed to his mission is different. That, that we would do what he's called us to do. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who what? Who earnestly seek him. And we seek him and then we follow through with what he says. That's what faith is. His mission is clear. We must believe in him and follow through. You know, we're told his mission, that we would go make disciples and make disciples. We uh, we make fishers of men, that we would go tell others. That's a great commission, that we would go make disciples of all nations, teach them everything about Jesus, baptize them into his name. I, I mean, that's a great commission. That's what we're called to. And some of us are like, yeah, I love being a follower of Jesus. That's great. And we're not faithful to the mission. We don't share like we're supposed to share. We don't, we don't tell others the love of our great God. This is what the Hebrew author writes. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And But my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. We belong to the ones that are faithful, that we're going we're gonna to follow through with what God says. How faithful are you to the mission of God? How faithful are you to loving him and sharing him with the world? We must stay faithful. That's what we're called to. We had a group of young people just get back from a a, a mission week of camp, and they didn't realize all the uh, necessities or stuff that we normally have around here that they weren't going to have up there. We didn't tell them before because we wanted them to go. I heard they're so looking forward to a hot shower and uh, sleeping in a bed. They, they slept in hammocks in these wood buildings up in this encampment to try to show them what missionaries do going into jungles all around the world. We went and visited back in March, and luckily we had beds. So we didn't have to sleep in the hammocks, which was really cool. <laughs> but the reason why was to show them some people are willing to risk everything, even the luxuries that we take for granted in order to get the gospel to others. How committed are we to the mission? All right, let's finish up 2 Chronicles 15 here, uh, beginning with the last part of verse 8. So after he was told this by the prophet, he took courage. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. Then he assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the people from Ephraim, Manasseh and Simeon, who had settled among them, for large numbers had come over to him from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with them. I mean, these are smart people, right? These are people that should be waving the banner of the north of Israel and saying, we are the north, right? Like the Toronto Raptors. But they should be saying that. And, and they don't. They say, we want to go with Asa. I, I know we have this north flag over here, but we'd rather have the flag of God, which is important for us. We'll talk about that here in a minute. They went over them. Uh, they, they assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. At that time, they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle, 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they had brought back. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul. Uh, a covenant is different than a contract or an agreement. It's not a handshake. It's not a, I will provide you this service and you provide me this money. That's not what, what a covenant is. A covenant is a, an all in together with God in that. And that's what they're saying. They entered in a covenant to seek the Lord. All who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were to be put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. This is one of those verses as a pastor you don't really like reading because it's not really uh, fun. So you're saying that, they were saying if you don't do this, you don't follow after the Lord, we're going we're gonna to kill you. Yeah, they're saying here's this agreement, here's this covenant. And we break that covenant uh, as a nation, uh, you know what, you're, you're not going to be around anymore. Now, people could leave. They didn't have to be part of this theocracy where God's in charge, right? It wasn't democracy. Uh, Asa was trying to make it a theocracy where God gets to dictate it. Uh, But they they said, hey, if you're not with us, we're taking you out. If we fall away, we need to be taken out. They took an oath to the Lord with loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpets and horns. All, All Judah rejoiced about the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. 
They sought God eagerly, and he was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. King Asa also deposed his grandmother, Macaw, from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut it down, broke it up, and burned it in the Kidron Valley, although he did not remove the high places from Israel. Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He brought in the temple of God the silver and gold and the articles that he and his father had dedicated. There was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. Asa didn't just hear from God. He acted upon it. Asa Asa did what what he knew he was supposed to do, what God told him to do. People from the other side, the northern kingdom, were saying, we want to be with this guy because he's doing what God wants him to do. Sacrificed animals. There was money. There was all this stuff that Asa gave over to God. They made this covenant. Agreeing to be in community in Judah at that time was agreeing to be under the rule of God. I mean, if there's one person in your life that you would never want to upset, who is that? I'll tell you who it is. It's grandma. <laughs> it's grandma, right? I mean, who, who has been for you more than anybody else in your life? It's grandma. I mean, if mom says no, ask grandma. He took his grandma off her throne. She was the queen mother. We know it was his grandma because it was his dad's mom, according to 1 Kings. And the word in Hebrew for mother and grandmother are the same, so you have to figure it out. That's why you have to look at all the different contexts. But so he takes grandma off. And, she, and grandma was worshiping Asherah, which is like the queen of heaven, this, this mother goddess that was a, a deity married to God, right? And it was, it was vulgar, sexual, and all this. And so he's, he's taking that down. He's saying, Grandma, you're no longer in, in charge of this. Uh, you're, you're out. His heart was fully committed to the Lord. And so he learned that in order to be committed to the Lord, you have to reform to honor the Lord, right? You have to reform. He got, he got things right. He got to work right away. He didn't just listen and not do it. He followed through with it. He knew honoring God meant being different than the world, meant being different than the other kings, the kings of the northern kingdom, the kings that had come before him and after him in the southern kingdom. He knew it meant to be different. And then the reform we we're talking about is not political reform. Most of the time when people hear the word reform, they think about political reform, tax reform, social justice reform, border reform, all this reform with political. Folks, I want to tell you that that is not what is most important to God. It's not, it's not political reform. I, I don't care. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on. Your, your hope should not be in Biden 2020 or Trump 2024 or somebody else 2024. Some of us care more about who's in charge of our government than we do who's in charge of our lives. Uh, Some of us uh, stand up for an elephant or a donkey more than we stand up for the one who sacrificed himself for us. Our lives should be reformed to honor our sovereign God. We should be talking more about Jesus than any political thing, and, and too often Christians are getting caught up in this political thing that's going on. And we need to stand up for truth. We need to stand up for what's right, bar none. I mean, I, I am for that have a meeting tomorrow with uh, one of our Wichita City Council women with a couple other pastors to talk about something. I mean, we need to do what's right. But my life is not based upon what our city council does, what our governor does, what our president does. My life is based upon what Jesus did and what I'm called to. Reform requires discipline and sometimes tough decisions. So we need to be changed by Jesus. We talk about this, be changed by Jesus, be reformed by Jesus. Reforming to honor God is the most important thing, although it's not always popular. Constant reformation needs to take place in my life, being who God wants me to be. Now, I would love for our country to reform. Uh, It needs to happen. We're far from God, but the Great Commission is not have your country be reformed. The church, Reformation in the church, uh, we go back to October of 1517, and, and we see the Great Reformation where Martin Luther and his 95 Thesis, and we see uh, a time where, where the church didn't line up with Scripture, the universal church. And so uh, Martin said to him, uh, he's like, hey, you know what? You don't line up with the Word. Things need to change. We've changed some stuff with uh, scriptural authority of the elders over the years here. Uh, man, we're, we're talking about personal reform, the heart of the gospel that we would turn to Christ and leave our old self. Hebrews 12 reminds us of this. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. We must reform by ridding ourselves of things that are dishonoring to Jesus. Uh, Puritan John Owen said, be killing sin or it will be killing you. How are you doing with that? 
We need to remove what could bring us down and allow God to fix things that are out of alignment. Have you ever driven a car out of alignment? I mean, you, you hit something or, or something happens and the alignment goes bad, and, and you can constantly be trying. I mean, it's, it's veer and left, but you constantly be trying to go right. And you can do that the rest of your life, be fighting against what you're supposed to be as a follower of Christ. Or you can take the car in and get it aligned, and you don't have to fight it. What do you need to align today? We need to fix the 1500, the reformers, they did this, and, and they said the universal church was off of, uh, of what God desired for them in life, uh, contrary to what God desired. And they broke away after the church said they weren't going to change, the universal church. And that's where the Reformation movement came from. Asa did things to show uh, that he was willing to do the tough things and reform. Aligning with the Bible in today's society isn't always easy. Matter of fact, you'll be called... Uh, narrow-minded. You'll be called a hater. But we need to know the Word of God. You want to know how to get aligned? He tells us. He gives us His Spirit to help us. Leslie Allen, the commentator, says, if the heart is committed to God, it will not shrink from making necessary changes, however radical and disturbing. What radical changes need to take place in your life today? What do you need to be reformed? Relationships, the way you treat your spouse, the way you treat your kids, your parents, your siblings, the way you treat your neighbors, coworkers. Maybe you need to give forgiveness where you've been holding on to it as if it's yours instead of God's to give. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's what you find pleasure in. Maybe it's extracurricular activity, what you're looking at on the computer screen, what you're saying, what you're thinking. Be killing sin, or it'll be killing you. Romans 12 reminds us, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Are you conformed to the world? Are you transformed by Christ? Asa was transformed. And he showed it by what he did, how he lived his life. May we do that too. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I want to tell you this. Your life, it is empty. I guarantee you that. You've tried to fill it with other things, but you need Jesus. He will radically transform who you are and make you so much better. Let's pray. God, we come today and we thank you for being a good God. We thank you for the opportunity we have to go from unrighteousness to righteousness through Jesus. Help us to be faithful with what you've entrusted to us like Asa was and made some tough calls, but he knew it was what you desired. Lord, I pray for tough calls that need to be made in this room and those online today. I pray that we would make them and we would stop fighting against the misalignment of our lives and we would allow you to align us according to your word. Lord, we love you and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.